All right, Jeff, I want to start uh, talking about the concept of sample sizes. I think this is something that when you're new to fantasy baseball, it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around. And you know, even when you're a veteran, I mean, it's not always obvious when a sample size, you know, when a sample is relevant and when a sample is too small. Um, and for example, you know, we could have someone like Unieski Betancourt off to a good start, and people could say, "Oh, it's a total fluke; it doesn't mean anything." Or you could say, "Well, no, this is you know, this shows that he has some power, and to the extent he gets at bats, he may actually produce." Typically, um, give me some general parameters of what constitutes a relevant sample um, for pitcher performance, hitter performance, different aspects of hitter and pitcher performance uh, in your fantasy leagues, Jeff. Well, let's back up first because I think we need to, since this is a 101, um, let's ignore all the on-a-pace things that you read in April and even in May because usually they're garbage. They're for entertainment purposes only, and they only throw you off when you're trying to figure out what this means. Uh, I would say, you know, it, the funny thing is we have to act as fantasy players before the stats that these guys are producing are really statistically significant. We try to look into the amplitude of what they're doing, we try to look into why they're doing what they're doing to see if there's any reason to believe in them. But usually the size of what they've done in one month is never going to be significant, yet we have to make these decisions right now. So that's, that's the complex uh, issue that we have to run into here. Um, but I would say if you're looking for a hitter, you probably need, what, 200 at-bats in a season to see, hey, is this for real? Maybe more? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head, though. It, it depends on the amplitude or magnitude of what he's doing, right? I mean, right. if a guy is just, you know, he's a 250 hitter with, you know, 10 to 15 home run power, and at the end of, you know, June, he's hitting 290 uh, with, you know, nine home runs, you know, that's nice. But I'm not sure I'm, I'm totally sold on, uh, on him being, you know, for real. Uh, but if he were to have 16 home runs at the, you know, in June uh, and hitting, 340, um, you know, he, he's probably not going to keep that up, but I may be sold that there's a real change taking place. So, you know, the magnitude is also important. I think it is really kind of magnitude uh, times time. You know, it, it's how well has he been doing and for how long. And for certain players, um, you know, here's, here's one, Brandon Crawford. You know, I mean, by the time people watch a one-on-one -on -one video, this may be a funny joke, you know, that we were even talking about Brad, Brandon Crawford. Right. But you talk about a guy who can't hit at all, and suddenly for a month, He's hitting for power. He's, you know, he's roping the ball. Um, he's producing runs. You know, what do you make of something like that? Well, I think you compare the player's age, his scouting profile, how he's going about doing things. I think it's a harder to de determine when a young guy that's breaking out, if you will, if that's for real, whereas compared to, say, a veteran that's slumping. Sure, a guy's slump can last all year, but the canonical examples are like, Derek Jeter slumping until June and still hitting 300 for a full season. That's you know those, that's when we always preach sample size. It's usually to try to t t talk people off the ledge about their slumping regulars. It's a good lesson to learn and relearn all the time. Uh, but younger guys, when they're breaking out, guys that are getting full time playing time for the first time in their careers, maybe they're in a better ballpark situation. These are the guys that that that's where we have to try to figure out is this real or not, and how do we act on it? How do we value it? And it's always the trickiest part. I would look for you know you know. Try, try to you know read as much as you can about the player. Do they have a new hitting coach? Does he have a different swing? Uh, look at see you know you know there's all these materials out there now, spray charts, how hard he's hitting a ball, you know how far he's hitting a ball. You know all these things add up over time. They, they add they're little pieces of the puzzle that we can apply. We're never going to have a complete answer. It's never going to be right out there in, in in red ink saying this is for real. No, I mean we just have to have all these little pieces, all these little clues act on the best on it the best we can. You think it's really important to know the cause? Like, let's say a guy has, you know, he's doing really well, and you figure out the cause is that he's got a 410 BABIP, right? Or you figure out the cause is, well, he's hitting the ball with a lot more velocity off the bat. That's why he has a 410 BABIP. I mean, do you think these things matter? Or maybe hitting the ball at high velocity for a certain sample is lucky also, that, that knowing the cause sometimes is you know, almost dangerous because you think it means something when, Really, knowing the cause isn't really that important. The key is whether that cause will persist. I, I think that's an excellent question. I don't think one size fits all even on that answer, too. Um, but let's take go back to your BABIP example. Starling Marte, I was asked about him on the radio, uh, and he, at, at the point we're talking about this, he had a 419 BABIP, and he's hitting 339. But he's a young uh, prospect of some repute. 
you know, the Pirates were excited to call him up last year. He had his moments last year where he was strong. He's off to a fantastic start in 2013. How much is, is that for real? How much of this is, we, we know there's going to be some regression, but regressing to what is always the question. Yeah, it's interesting. I think the general rule for people is for players who we really know about, unless there's some injury uh, or unless there's some major change or unless the guy was 38 last year and this year he's 39, uh, pretty much assume that most sample, that the sample's too small until we get to at least midseason, right? And, and just bank on the fact that he's probably the guy he is. For pitchers, it's a little different, but for hitters, I think that's the safe bet. Um, you're going to miss out on some Jose Bautistas. You're going to miss out uh, on some guys who really do fall off the cliff out of nowhere. But for the most part, I think if you're a beginner, um, you want a pretty big sample before you start drawing major conclusions. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Uh, now, I think I'm willing to act quicker on hitters that are breaking out than hitters that are slumping. I'm willing to act quicker on hitters and pitchers, too. Uh, well, I, I take that back, actually. I take that back. Um, I'm willing to believe in a hitter doing well, I think, more, quicker than I am a pitcher. Because there's a pitcher, there's so many other variables. There's opponent, there's time of year you're facing in the ballpark. All of these things also apply. Um, what, when is a good sample for pitchers for you? I think it's different than what it is for hitters. Well, I think with pitchers, the magnitude is really important, right? The signature starts. Mm -hmm. um, if a guy, you know, is throwing a couple of, you know, shutouts or one-run games and he's striking out five and he's walking one or two uh, and he's, you know, preventing hard contact and keeping the ball in the park, that's nice, but I'm not really going to get excited about that. If a guy comes up like Tony Singrani, he's dominating, striking out 12, striking out 11, uh, really missing a lot of bats, uh, then I'm going to get excited, even if it's only two or three starts. If Matt Harvey comes out and blows people away, I'm going to get excited. I don't you know, care as much about the guys who are just the command specialists. To me, they're pitching on much finer margins for error. You know? And so when the good luck and the perfect location goes you know, on, a, on a weaker start, uh, that can be totally reversed. Whereas the guys who are really dominating, it can be just three or four starts, and I'm much more likely to buy it. Right. And it's important to look beyond the stats, not just – Watch these guys pitch, too, because you see Singrani making Bryce Harper look foolish with all fastballs. Compare that to, like, the little run that Jared, Jared Washburn had a few years ago. I think that's the example of where you just look at the numbers. Yeah, he's dominant. No, he had a nice little stretch of runs. He was tricking hit. He was tricking uh, hitters, but at the same time, I don't think that he was dominant in the classical sense of dominance. Uh, the, the canonical example of being wary of signature significance, of course, is Luke Kochaver, at least – between right. me and you, it is because of the discussions we've had him have a couple of these sort of starts. Every now and then, he would pull out a ridiculous ten strikeout, you know, right. second inning shutout type of start, uh, you know, sandwiched between uh, two eight run blowups, uh, and so he was a very tough guy to read. And I agree, one signature start or, or you know, ones here or there, okay, but I think two or three signature starts in a row, um, I'm buying. You know, I'm believing that for the most part. 